Good morning. Welcome to Victory Community Church. We're so glad that you could tune in today. We, we pray that the service will be a blessing to you. Uh, I want to encourage you the, this morning to take a moment and greet one another. You can do that by posting uh, a, a little uh, greeting to one another. It's important that we stay connected and people like to hear from you. So just take a moment and, and uh, you can post something online there and, and just say hello to, to your friends and family. Uh, we encourage you again, once again, to stay connected during this time. You know, this, this can be a difficult time for some. I know some people are experiencing isolation and loneliness, and uh, there's so many ways that we can stay connected to each other today with all the technology we have. So I encourage you to reach out and, and stay connected to people. And also, if you, if you have a need, please call us uh, or, or send us an email or text us. Uh, we're, we're still here, and, and if you have a need, we want to pray with you. We want to encourage you. So please take a moment and reach out to us and let us know that you have a need because we love you and we care about you. Uh, I also want to remind you that we have put some, uh, uh, some good things on the website for you to help you with your personal prayer life. We have 25 scriptures to keep you strong in your faith. Uh, I encourage you to go on and take a look at them and read them over and pray them. Also, we have a, a, a little prayer guide on there that will help you with your, with your daily prayer to God. It will help you, help you go in the right direction and jumpstart you. Uh, so I encourage you to do that. Uh, this morning, we're going to get ready to worship the Lord together. I just encourage you to find a, a comfortable space and uh, either stand up or sit down and get ready to worship the Lord together. Let's just take a moment to pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together. We thank you, Lord, that even though we, we're coming together uh, by our computers or our iPads, we know that you are here. Father, your word says you never leave us or forsake us, and your presence surrounds us. Father, I pray that as we, as we engage in the service this morning, God, that your presence would just permeate the, the very air that we breathe, and we thank you this morning for your presence as we worship you. You said where two or three are gathered, there you are in the midst of us. We welcome your presence with us today, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Nothing can separate, even if I ran away, your love never fails. I know I still make mistakes, but you have new mercies for me every day, your love never fails. Joy comes in the morning. And when the oceans rage, I don't have to be afraid because I know that you love me. Because your love never fails. Oh no. Your love never fails. The wind is strong and the water's deep, but I'm not alone here in these open seas. Cause your love never fails. was far too wide I never thought I'd reach the other side your love never fails you 
stay the same through the ages. Your love never changes. There may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. And when the oceans reach, I don't have to be afraid. Because I know that you love me Your love never fails Your love never fails You make all things Work together for my good. You make all things work together for my good. Cause you make all things work together for my good. Cause you make all things work together for my good God you make all things work together for my good I would rather be no place I would rather be no place I would rather be than here in your love here in your love no place I would rather be there's no place I would rather be there's no place I would rather be here in your love here in your love Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Cause I want more of you, God. There's no other place I'd rather be than right here in your arms, Father, in the arms of you, God. And I will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken I will build my life upon your Yeah. 
not be shaken. I put my trust in you, God. I put my trust in you, God. us, Lord. You are with us, Lord. You are with us, Lord. And nothing can stand against. You are with us, Lord. You are with us, Lord. You are with us, Lord. And nothing can stand against. I will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation i will put my trust in you and i will not be shaken We're going to receive our morning offering this morning, and I just want to take a moment to thank you for your faithfulness in giving. I know it's been a challenging time for people financially as well as uh, the environment that we're living in right now, but I, I thank you for your faithfulness. You know, uh, even though we're not here physically in the building, we still have a budget to meet, and, and it's because of your faithfulness that we can do that. So I, I, again, I thank you for your faithfulness. I want to read a scripture this morning, uh, 2 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, verse 6. It says, but, I, but this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he has purposed in his heart and not grudgingly or out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, uh, so that always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. That's God's plan, that you would always have an abundance for everything. Uh, as always, we know that giving is a heart thing. It's not just something we do mechanically. We want to do it with our heart connected to it. The Bible says doing it with a cheerful and glad heart. You know, it's great to give. Uh, the Bible says it's more blessed to give than to receive. And it's a great thing. I love to give. And so this morning as we've come together to give, I just want to encourage you to, to keep your heart connected. You ask the Lord what your part is. And, and be faithful and be obedient to do that. Uh, again, I want to remind you of how you can give, uh, since we're not here in the building. Uh, if you have one of our tithe envelopes, you can just stick a stamp on it and throw it in the mail, and you'll be all set. You can also uh, give online at, 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 at discovervcc.org at the Give tab. Or, or if you need our physical address, it's 1619 Manitow Road, Rochester, New York, 14626. So you can do that. And, and let's just uh, speak a blessing. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to give. Father, I thank you that your word says give and it will be given back unto us good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Father, I speak a blessing over every person that gives this morning. Father, I thank you that you'll meet their personal needs, that you would just cause abundance in their homes. Father, bless their coming in and their going out. They're rising up and they're lying down. Father, bless their family and their children and their, and their savings and their, uh, and, and their finances, Father God. We thank you, Lord, that you are their source. You are their provider. And we thank you for abundance in their home in Jesus' name. And today we give this with a glad and cheerful heart. And we thank you, Lord, that we can continue to give to the work of the ministry, that lives will be changed, that hearts will be saved. And we thank you, Lord, that we can do it with a, with a right heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Make sure you smile when you, when you give. Amen. Good morning. Last week we uh, began a new series, Faith in the Midst of a Crisis. And uh, what better time to talk about faith and trusting in God and standing strong in God's word than during a time like this. Throughout the word of God, we see, uh, we, 
individuals and, and uh, families and even nations that faced difficult times, crisis, and, and things of that nature. And, and there are principles that we can see in the Word of God uh, that uh, not just tell us what happened, but, and not just to share an uplifting story, but to tell us, to show us principles from God's Word, time-tested principles that we can apply in any crisis. There are two things that we can say about storms, and that's what we've been talking about, storms. Uh, we will all face storms in life. Uh, that's just a fact of life. We will all face storms. And the other thing I want to tell you is that storms will not last forever. And, and so I, I want to share some principles from God's Word that will help you survive the storm. Different parts of the country, you know, as we, as we look in the, uh, the natural, uh, different parts of the country face different types of storms. Uh, in the south, they face tornadoes and hail. And, uh, in the coastal cities, they deal with hurricanes. Uh, in the northeast, in the Midwest, we deal with snow. Uh, and uh, in, the, in the west, they have earthquakes and fires and mudslides. Even though we're talking about environmental storms, uh, many of us face some storms in our personal life. And they have been violent and destructive, and uh, they cause pain, just as natural storms do. What are some of the storms we face uh, in our personal lives? Well, maybe sickness, like this global pandemic that we're pandemic that we're going through. Uh, maybe you have some storms in your relationship. Maybe you have uh, financial issues, loss of jobs, or you have financial needs, tragedies, accidents, deaths, crisis. People uh, treat you wrong. All of these things uh, can be turbulent in your life, and storms do not discriminate. Uh, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter your color or your age or your social status. Uh, your political uh, ideals, or even your religious persuasion. Storms do not discriminate. They come to everyone. Uh, and, and God wants us, uh, God even warns us to think that uh, we will not have storms in our life. It's is just not the truth. First Peter, if you turn in your Bible to First Peter 4, verse 12, it says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning fiery trials, which is to try you, as though some strange thing has happened to you. What does that mean? It means the Bible's telling us that, that uh, trials or storms will come to everyone, and we shouldn't think that it's strange or out of the ordinary. There is a misconception sometimes or a wrong conclusion that people of faith can sometimes come to. They think that if I do everything right and, and I don't make any mistakes and I don't miss it, uh, if I pray enough and believe enough that I will not have any problems or storms in my life, and that simply is not true. Uh, I wish it were true, but uh, the truth is that uh, you can never sin or you can never uh, make a mistake or, and still not face a storm. Those things don't determine whether storms come or, or go. And Jesus is a great example of this. We know that Jesus never sinned. We know that he lived a, a flawless life when he was here on the earth. And he is the only one that, that can say that, that he never sinned. He never made a mistake. He was always in the perfect will of God. So was he able to live his life without facing storms, without facing uh, things, uh, adversity? No, the Bible tells us clearly that he had storms in his life, but he prevailed every time. You think back to your, uh, the Bible, and it talks about when Jesus was born. Herod, King Herod, was trying to, ki to kill him, and they killed all the children two, two, two years of age and less. Uh, all throughout his ministry, there was troubles and things that persecuted him. Uh, his own family reviled him and didn't believe in him. Uh, he was despised and accused of being a, a blasphemer and a heretic and a drunk. And all on several, several occasions, people tried to kill him. So if Jesus faced storms and adversity, we too will face them in this life. But the good news is, is that God has made a way for you to, to come out of these storms successfully. When, you, when uh, we face storms, we can be encouraged because the Bible has a lot to say about the storms of life. And we need to know how to survive them and overcome them. Uh, I am sure of this when it comes to storms. Uh, God does not want the storms of life to destroy you. 
And God does not want the storms of life to rob you of your purpose and your destiny in him. God has given us information from the word of God that we can use to overcome the storms that come our way. We can overcome every challenge. Psalm 34 verse 19 says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. The Bible says God delivers you out of all of them. It uh, doesn't mean that you won't face them. It doesn't mean that we won't deal with them. You'll have afflictions. You'll have adversity. You'll have things to overcome. But if you'll listen and pay attention when God gives you direction, he'll help you to overcome them. I, I want to read from Matthew, the seventh chapter, uh, verse 24. It says, Therefore, whoever hears these, these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on a rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the wind blew and beat on the house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the, and the winds blew and beat upon the house, and it fell, and, and great was its fall." Jesus gives us one of the first keys to surviving the storms of life, and that's simply practicing what you hear, practicing the Word of God, being a doer of the Word. Some storms came to both of these men in this story. There was a wise man and a foolish man. The storms came to both of them. Uh, in other words, being a doer of the Word will not necessarily prevent a storm from coming to you, but it did empower him. It did empower him uh, to survive the violent storm. There are some storms that you may, may be able to stop from coming to you. Other storms you might have to weather through. However, uh, God wants to protect you in either case. Matthew 7 teaches us uh, a key to surviving the storms of life, and that's simply being a doer of God's word. Uh, in other words, obedience is a key to overcoming the storms of life. Let's just say that together. You say it at home or wherever you are. Obedience is a key to overcoming the storms of life. That's a good thing to remember when you're facing difficulties. Your response to the storm is based on the storm you are facing, much like in the natural. Uh, if there's a tornado outside, you're going you're gonna to handle that storm differently than you would if it was a snowstorm or an earthquake or a hailstorm. We respond to the storm that's in front of us. In the same way, the Bible gives us insight into the, some of the storms in our, that we may face. It is essential that you understand and, and know the reason for the storm so that you know how to successfully get through it. We're going to take a look this morning at four different people in the Bible uh, that survived storms successfully. Uh, and the first one that we're going to look at is Noah. Uh, you can learn some valuable lessons from each one of these people that we're going to look at this morning. Uh, the first one we're going to look at is Noah. We know that Noah was commanded by God to build an ark. Uh, and, and take along uh, male and female, pairs of uh, male and female animals with him. Uh, the account of Noah is found in the book of Genesis chapter 6. I want to read verse 13 and 14. It says, God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make room in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. And then it goes on to explain uh, how he's to build that ark. In verse 21 it says, And you shall take for yourself all food that is eaten, and you shall gather it to yourself, and, and it shall be food for you and for them. Thus Noah did according to all that God commanded him, and so he did. Uh, one thing I want to point out here is we know that Noah built an ark and he took the animals with him and as God directed. Uh, what, did, uh, what did Noah do to survive the storm? I think one of the most important things that we can see here is that, that Noah prepared himself. He prepared himself. Noah did according to all that God had commanded him to do. How long did it take for, for Noah to build an ark? 
Well, the Bible doesn't clearly say, but Bible historians believe that it took somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to 100 years to build that ark. Now, that's what I call preparation. He prepared himself. He heard from God. He did what God said, and he, he uh, got himself ready. And God was able to protect him and his family and the animals on the ark. What was uh, all that time before the flood came, Noah was getting himself ready. I believe the best time to prepare for a storm in your life is before it hits, keeping yourself in a ready condition, keeping yourself uh, listening to God. Uh, we, you know, the Bible talks about how Noah gathered food for himself. I believe that's a key for us too, that when, we are, when we're not facing a storm, that we should gather food for ourselves. What does that mean? Well, it's not necessarily going to the grocery store and buying out the store, uh, you know, being a hog with all the toilet paper that we're seeing today. I, I believe it's reading the Word of God. I believe it's meditating on God's Word, stocking up on the Word of God in your heart and in your life. The Word of God is our spiritual food reading the Bible, hearing the Word of God being preached, gathering with believers, church and prayer and worship. These are the things that are going to keep you strong and ready for any situation that might come your way. The best preparation for the challenges of tomorrow is the right use of today. Let me say that again. The best, the best preparation for, for the challenges that are ahead of us tomorrow is the, the right use of today, meaning make the most of today. Press into God today. Get your life ready with God today. Put yourself in a place of readiness and prepare now. Uh, another person that we want, we want to look at in the Word of God that su successfully survived a storm is Jonah. If you look at the book of Jonah, uh, Jonah was a prophet of God. I want to just give you a little background about Jonah. He was a prophet of God who lived at the time of Jeroboam II. Jonah was instructed by God to go to Nineveh. Uh, Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. Uh, in the Bible, we learn of three dominant empires, the Egyptians, of course, the Assyrians, and the Babylonians. Jonah was sent to the, uh, to the Assyrians, and, and there were, uh, uh, they were a pagan people who caused havoc in all of Israel. Uh, therefore, Jonah found it hard to accept the fact that God would offer mercy to Nineveh of Assyria when all of its inhabitants, uh, in Jonah's opinion, deserved judgment. God gave Jonah an assignment. God instructed him uh, to go and preach the gospel to uh, the people of Nineveh. You know, when God tells us to do something, uh, it's not optional. There's, it's not up for debate. It's not, a, it's not up for discussion. When we see that God tells us something, we have to do it. We have to obey. And so he told Jonah to go to Nineveh and cry out against, against it because of their sin. Obedience is what was required. And when God gives us instructions or assignment, we too must obey. We must do what God tells us to do. Refusal to, dis to respond can certainly carry unavoidable repercussions. That is why it's important for us to follow the instructions and the direction of God in our life. What did Jonah do when God gave him these instructions? Well, the Bible tells us that instead of going to Nineveh, uh, Jonah fled to Tarshish, which is a, a long way from Nineveh. Jonah disobeyed God's instructions. What was the result of Jonah's disobedience? Well, the Bible tells us that a great storm came upon the ship that he was on. And why did that storm come? Because of his willful disobedience. I want to read from Jonah, the first chapter, verse 12. It says, And he said to them, this is Jonah speaking, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know this great tempest is because of me. Jonah knew enough about himself, he knew enough about God, that he knew that his disobedience was causing this storm in the lives of all these people on the ship. 
Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to return to the land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more temptuous, temptuous against them. Isn't it interesting here that, that the storm is the result of Jonah's disobedience, yet they are trying to fix uh, this situation another way. They thought, well, we know what to do. We'll work harder. We'll row to shore. We'll fix it. Uh, they did not understand what they were dealing with. There was a supernatural element at, involved here. Uh, and uh, they, you can't use natural things to solve supernatural problems. And, and so they were trying to come up with a natural solution to this supernatural event. And, and so many times we can be like that. We try to alleviate circumstances uh, Oh, uh, by one means instead of doing what we know to do. In, in this particular case, uh, we know the best way to get out of some storms is through repentance. R-E-P-E-N-T. Repent. Uh, and, and the best way to get out of some storms is just simply obey. We need to obey what God has said. In fact, if Jonah would never, uh, Jonah would have never faced this particular storm if he had obeyed God to begin with. Uh, that lets me know that obedience will not only get you out of a storm, some storms, but uh, it will also keep them or prevent them to begin with. So they threw Jonah overboard, and the Bible tells us that the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow him. Uh, where he would stay for three days and three nights. It is here in the belly of this fish that we begin to see a response to the disobedient storm. Uh, in Jonah, the second chapter, in verse 1, it says, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly. And he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction. And he answered me, Out of the belly of she Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. So we know that the Bible says that Jonah cried out. He, he called out to the Lord, uh, and he turns back to God, and he promises to keep his vow and commitments to the Lord. So the Lord, we know the Bible tells us the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited J Jonah up onto dry land. When Jonah repented and turned to the Lord and chose to be obedient to God, the storm ended. Jonah went on to accomplish the will of God. He went to Nineveh and he preached against the sin. And, and that city uh, was, uh, re, re, they had great revival. People turned back to the Lord. They, they, they repented of their sin. So we see that when you, when you obey, God does great things. Jonah was spared. The men that were on the ship were spared. And there was a miraculous revival in Nineveh. So we know that obedience and repentance can get you out of some storms that you're in. Uh, and again, not all the storms, not all storms are the same. Uh, and, and so we need to hear the wisdom of the Lord concerning some of these things. Uh, the third person we're going to look at this morning is Jesus. I want to look at Mark, the fourth chapter. Mark chapter 4 we have the account there of Jesus and his disciples uh, in a boat crossing over the lake. And it says on the same, verse 35 says, On the same day when the evening had come, he said to them, Let's, Let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care if we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? We know from the life of Jesus that he had a life of purpose. He was here on a mission. He had, he had things to accomplish. And, and he said to the, his disciples, let us cross over 
to the other side. That was the plan of God. This is significant to understand in this particular type of storm. Jesus did not live a pur- purposeless life. Uh, he was a man of purpose. He came to seek and save what was lost, the Bible tells us. He came to set the captives free. He came to preach the good news of the gospel. He wanted the oppressed to be set free and delivered. He wanted to heal the sick. Uh, and so we know that Jesus Jesus had much to accomplish, and he said to his disciples, let's go to the other side. Why did this storm come to Jesus? Well, I believe this storm came to hinder Jesus from fulfilling his purpose and his assignment from God. There are storms that will arise in your life. When you are striving to please God and do his will, uh, storms will come up to hinder you. Jesus did everything right. He lived a sinless life. He was walking in the will of God, yet he still faced this particular storm. Uh, You know, if the enemy uh, caused a storm uh, in the life of Jesus to take him off course, you can count on it that he's also going to uh, send storms your way to take you off course. Uh, Satan uh, strategically causes trials and storms and problems and tests and, and things to take you out of the race, to cause you to be discouraged, to cause you to give up and quit, to cause you to, to throw in the towel. He wants to hinder you. He wants to destroy you, and he will keep you from fulfilling what God has for you in your life. The Bible gives us a powerful key here to overcoming this particular kind of storm. And again, I read in Mark 4, verse 39, it says, Then he arose and he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. Jesus used his words. When the enemy is throwing this type of storm at you, the solution is to resist it and rebuke it. Uh, you speak to it in the name of Jesus. There's, a, there's power and authority in our words because we are in Christ Jesus. Someone said, well, you know, that was Jesus. He could stand up and speak to the wind and the waves. Well, you know, it's interesting here that Jesus takes issue with his disciples because they didn't do it. Jesus had expected them to take, uh, take initiative and take care of that storm. In verse verse 40, it said, but he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? What is Jesus saying? He's saying that they could have taken care of the storm, that they had power, they had authority to take care of this particular storm. We know the the Bible tells us in Luke, the 10th chapter, verse 19, it says, Behold, I give you authority uh, to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, that nothing shall by any means hurt you. This power had been given to his disciples, and they could have spoke to the storm just as Jesus did. We, too, have that same power and authority. We have power and authority in our words. As we believe in Jesus, we can speak and resist resist the enemy. We can speak to circumstances. We can speak to mountains. We can speak to storms in our life, and they have to obey us. Uh, As believers, we too, God God expects us to use the power that he has given to us. The book of James talks about resisting the enemy, and he will flee from us. We have to stand our ground and know our rights as believers. The disciples had this this authority, but they chose not to use it. Uh, You know, we can learn from their mistakes when we find ourselves in a position where the enemy is bringing a storm to distract us or discourage us or take us off course. We, too, can stand up in the midst of that storm, rebuke it and resist it in the name of Jesus, and it must go. These are the situations uh, that we, we need to use our faith. So, uh, again, we don't handle everything the same way. We, saw that we see that Noah survived the storm through preparation, by acting on what God told, us, told him to do. Jonah survived the storm through repentance, 
there was some areas of his life that were out of order and he repented and he began to obey and God set him free from the storm. Jesus resisted the storm. He rebuked the storm and it went away. So we handle things differently. It's not just one size fits all. Uh, the last one I want to look at today is the Apostle Paul. Let's turn over to Acts, the 27th chapter. In this p particular portion uh, of church history, Paul had already spent time in jail in Jerusalem and in Caesarea. And now he had appealed to Caesar and was being shipped to Rome to stand trial. In Acts 27, it gives the, the account of Paul setting sail for Rome. Paul, uh, Paul warns the men on the ship that the voyage would end in disaster. And instead of listening to Paul, they pressed on and eventually the entire ship was destroyed. Sometimes we suffer in storms because of the actions of others. And Paul was in this particular situation. If the sailors and the centurion had listened to Paul, they would have never faced the storm to begin with. Often God tries to prevent things in our life. He'll try to prevent storms from happening. If we'll listen, we can avoid some things in life. But if we don't listen and we just do our own thing, uh, we might find ourselves in, in perilous times. You, you think of here uh, with this situation with Paul, why, didn't the, why did the centurion and the captain disregard what Paul had to say? Well, it was very simple. They thought they knew better. They thought, I'm not going to listen to this preacher in chains. I bet I'm a captain of the ship. I'm, I'm going to do what I want. Well, they thought they knew more than he did, and they didn't. And so they, they found themselves in trouble. In Acts, the 27th chapter, I want to read from verse 18. And, and because we were exceedingly uh, tempest-tossed, the next day they lightened the ship. On the third day, we threw the ship's tackle overboard with our own hands. Now, whether, now when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest beat on us, all hope that we would be saved was finally given up. What was happening here? They had been in this horrible storm for days. They hadn't eaten or they hadn't slept, and, uh, and they threw things overboard to lighten the ship. They were trying to survive, and uh, all hope was gone, and they were certain they would not survive. And in verse 21 it says, But after a long abstinence from food, then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me. And have not sailed. Uh, and now I urge you to take heart, for you will not, there will be no loss of life among you, but only the ship. You know, uh, the Apostle Paul, he tells it like it is. He said, we wouldn't be in this mess if you would have listened to me. Not that he was being a told you so, but he was. He, he knew ahead of time. Paul survived this storm by riding it out. He had perseverance. Uh, here we begin to see some of the principles, again, of handling a storm. Uh, you know, don't hold a grudge. Don't become bitter. Don't, uh, don't wish destruction on your enemies. Paul did not get bitter at these men. In fact, I believe that Paul had a heart for the men that were on the ship with him. And we read in verse 17, it says, uh, Proverbs 24, verse 17 says, Do not rejoice when your enemy falls, and do not let your heart be glad when they stumble. I believe that, that Paul had a heart for these men. Paul cared about the men that were traveling with him. In the middle of the storm, he reminds them to eat and, and, and that they're going to be okay, that only the ship would be destroyed. In verse 23 of Acts 27, it says, For there stood by me this night an angel of God, to whom I belong and whom I serve. Boy, that's a good piece of advice right there. In the midst of a storm, remind yourself of who you are. Remind yourself of who you belong to. Uh, it's easy to forget when, you're, when, when there's a storm raging around you. But you need to take time to remember who you belong to. Uh, verse 24, it says, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. To me, this language uh, suggests that Paul had been praying for these men. 
and God granted uh, that, that they would survive with him. You know, uh, sometimes we, we may find ourselves in a situation, uh, and, and we might be the only one in that situation that knows how to pray. Don't, don't take that for granted. You're in that situation to intercede on behalf of everyone. Uh, and this is why you are there. You need to lift up your voice to God. You need to pray and seek him and uh, ask him to, for wisdom and ask him to bring protection and guide you and give you direction in the midst of the storm. Verse uh, 25 again, he says, Therefore take heart, men, for I believe that, that God, that it will be just as... Uh, for I believe God that it will be just as he told it to me. And, and that's exactly what happened. Paul looked beyond the bad things that were happening. Paul could have looked at the storm just as well as the men did. The waves that were crashing over and the, uh, the darkness and all the, the things that were going wrong uh, that day. But Paul, instead of looking at the storm, he chose to trust, put his trust in God. In the midst of the storms of our life, we... Uh, we need to use our faith. Our faith must be firmly centered on God. We are trusting and believing in God to provide for us, to lead us, to guide us, and to help us. The Bible says for us to trust in the Lord with all of our hearts. That's not just in the good times. That's no matter what's happening in your life. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. The storms of life they come to us all. However, we can survive the storms of life by following the principles that are laid out for us in the Word of God. Again, just like Noah, Noah prepared himself by planting the Word of God in his heart. He held on to what God said, that he would survive, that if he would build an ark, that God would protect him. So we see him developing that relationship with God and using his faith to build that ark. Uh, like Jonah, Jonah uh, repented before the Lord, and, and, and he asked God to forgive him, and he, he recommitted himself to doing what God called him to do, and it caused the storm that surrounded him to cease. Jesus stood up in the midst of his storm, and he rebuked the wind and the waves, and he spoke to it, and he commanded it to be still. Uh, there are times when the enemy will, will bring a storm in your life, and you're going to have to do just as Jesus did. Stand up and speak to it. You speak to it in the name of Jesus, and you tell it to be peaceful and still. Uh, or you might be like Paul, where Paul prayed, and he trusted in God, and he rode out the storm, and he came out on the other side successful. There are times we're going to have to ride out the storm, and we're going to have to remind ourselves that God is with us. No matter what happens, no matter what it looks like, we lean in, and we hold on to God, and we, we trust him, and we pray, and God will give us the wisdom. So no matter what you face in this life, I want you to know that it's not God's plan for, for you to, to be taken out by the storms of life. God has good things in store for you. And you need to uh, put your faith in him and, and start renewing your mind. Remember who you are in Christ Jesus. God has given you the victory and he wants to bring you out of no matter what the storm is, he wants to bring you out on the other side. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Say all. All. No matter what the storm is, no matter what brought the storm on, the Lord knows the answer. He has the key to bring you out of that storm. So you just need to look to him, and he'll give you that wisdom that you need. I'd like to pray with you today as we close our service. Let's just take a moment and pray. Uh, I believe that God is here for us right now. Heavenly Father, we thank you that no matter what we're going through today, I know that you are a God who wants to bring about good things. You want to bring us out of the trouble that we are in, whether it's financial, whether it's sickness in our body, whether it's family trouble, relationship trouble. No matter what it is, Lord, you have the answer. You know how to deliver us. You know how to bring us through it. And Father, we thank you that you are willing and able to do that. Father, we pray that the Spirit of God would lead us 
us and guide us in all truth, that we would stand strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Lord, that we would remember who we are in Christ Jesus and not walk in fear. You have not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. Father, we, we pray that you would give us wisdom in the midst of a storm, that we would know how to overcome in every situation. Father, you alone are good, and we, we just give you thanks that you love us and that you care about us. And we thank you, Lord, that you are our deliverer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Just want to remind you that we love you and we care about you. God bless you, and we'll see you next week. Bless you.